Well then, if our previous chapter didn't properly shock you, you weren't paying any attention. <laughs> because in our search for happiness, we've introduced Buddha's solution. And it's kind of outrageous. Because what Buddha proposed is that happiness is our natural state. You don't need to add anything to yourself to be blissfully happy. Just remove what makes you unhappy or what makes you suffer. And how are you going to do that? And that's another shocker. <laughs> You're going to do that by solving a riddle. <laughs> and the riddle goes like this. When you say I, what exactly do you mean? It may seem like a silly question, but actually it's not. Because it turns out there are two possible perspectives on that issue of I-ness. <laughs> One is a regular, everyday perspective that most of us all around the world share. And that is a perspective of your thinking mind. All people all around the world, all the time, are identifying themselves with their thoughts and emotions and perceptions and body sensations and so on and so on. So you will hear people say things like, I think that. So my I has an opinion about something. <laughs> or even, I am angry. So that I-ness that I have, somehow, is being consumed by the emotion of anger. Because I is angry, or I am angry. Well, maybe, but you may ask yourself an interesting question. How do I know that I am angry? Or how do I know what I am thinking? There is, well, another perspective on that same I-ness. You may call it a witnessing perspective. That is perfectly aware of your thoughts and emotions and body sensations, but it's somehow it's not pulled into all that drama of emotions and thoughts and perceptions swirling around you, blowing around like a leaf in the wind and so on and so on. And that perspective, that witnessing perspective, is what Buddha called your true nature, or your true self, you may call it. And that is a position of power. That is your position of power. When you pull yourself out of the drama of your thoughts and emotions to the witnessing perspective, you may observe your thoughts and your emotions and your perceptions and so on without being pulled into all that drama. So it turns out there are two possible perspectives. You may call it your true nature, you may call it your false nature or your false identification or ego, however you wish. And it is a perfect example that it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. That shift from identification with your thinking mind to identification with your true self, your witnessing perspective, is a really profound shift with immense practical applications in your everyday life. And, of course, we talked a lot about that in our previous chapter, so if you feel the need to update your understanding or refresh your memory, please go back and watch it. But for now, we'll just share one simple example, uh, just to get us going. So let's say, for example, that you asked your friend for a favor. Maybe you asked him to pick you up at the airport when you return from your holidays with your wife. But right now, you are sitting at the airport with your wife and with your luggage, <laughs> and he is not there. And then you call him on the phone to see what's going on, and he is at home because he completely forgot about it. <laughs> and now you are angry. How could he? <laughs> that idiot. Or you are feeling guilty, because that's my fault. I should have known that I cannot rely on him, or I should have at least uh, reminded him yesterday to pick me up today. Or maybe you feel sad because, oh, these days you can't rely on anyone. But most likely you are angry. <laughs> and then 
what, what are you going to do? Of course, you're going to take a cab and that cab is going to take you home. No big deal. But if you identify yourself with that emotion of anger, by saying, I am angry, <laughs> by feeling angry, <laughs> then you are going to spend the rest of the day being angry. And maybe even tomorrow and day after that. And in, during that time, you are going to have angry thoughts. You are going to think about what are you going to tell him and how are you going to get even or <laughs> whatever. And that just doesn't serve you. And you will assume that your anger is justified because your mind will make it real and it will create more thoughts and more sensations that will put you in the vibration of anger and give you somehow the right to be angry. But what really makes you suffer in this moment is not the thing itself because, you know, he just didn't come and you took a cab and everything is fine. It is your mental complaining. How could he? I should have known better, blah, blah, blah. That's what's keeping you in the state of anger. Because you are holding on to anger. It is you who are holding on to anger. Maybe someone made you angry for, I don't know, 15 seconds, a minute. But everything after that, is you're holding on to anger. You are drinking poison and expect the other person, your friend, to die. <laughs> and that just doesn't serve you in any positive way. It's your mental complaining that's creating that suffering. And if you identify yourself with the well, false self, with your thinking mind, with your perceptions, with your sensation of anger, emotion of anger, angry thoughts, well, then you are just going to stay in that state well, for a prolonged period of time. Maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks. But if you identify yourself with your true nature, if you know beyond shadow of a doubt that thoughts are something that you have, not something that you are, emotions, body sensations, this is all something that you have, not something that you are. You will notice that, oh, look, I'm angry. Does that serve me in any positive way? No. I can't change the past. He was supposed to pick me up and he didn't. <laughs> I mean, so what? <laughs> so now I'm sitting in a cab and I'm going home and everything is fine. And I can choose to react to respond to that situation, not just react, but to respond to the situation differently. I'm just going to forget about it and I'm going to enjoy this beautiful day. <laughs> and I'm not going to dwell into my anger. But, and this is, well, the kicker, <laughs> it is just not easy for us. It doesn't come natural to any of us to assume that witnessing position. You need to remind yourself daily that emotions and thoughts are something that you have and not something that you are. And you are doing that by sitting in the meditation at least 15 minutes a day. And when you sit in the meditation, you observe your thoughts, you observe your emotions, you observe your perceptions and body sensations without any judgment. Okay. And this is actually the key. And there are many stories in a Buddhist tradition, Zen tradition, that are designed to show you that uh, difference between a part of a drama and just witnessing it. And some of them may seem even cruel <laughs> because they are designed to jolt you into well, understanding. So, for example, there is one story that says that one lady comes to Zen master, uh, old wise man, and she has a problem because her husband passed away a few years back, but she is still very sad and she says that whenever I think about him, I feel sadness and heaviness and I miss him so much. And 
what should I do? And he said, well, lady, in that case, just don't think about him. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but of course, there is something inside us that immediately jumps out. You know, that wasn't a nice thing to say. That lady is in trouble, she is in a lot of pain. Yes, she is. And he offered the solution. Don't think about him. I mean, you are not going to bring him back by thinking about him. You are just putting a lot of sadness and misery in your life. And why are you doing that? Please stop thinking about him. But it's not that simple, isn't it? No. Because thoughts are coming and going and they always will. But the trouble is that we are identifying ourselves with them and then we feel justified in being sad or whatever and then we stick into that emotion for a long time. And if you enjoy that emotion, that's fine. But if you don't, just remember that you are an observer of all that drama. You are not exactly part of it. You are not obligated <laughs> to feel sad. <laughs> there is another way. And that technique, that Buddha's solution, as you can see, is all about healthy detachment. So it's fine to have thoughts, it's fine to have emotions and perceptions and everything is fine. But if they make you suffer, if they make you well, unhappy, just remind yourself that it is something that you have, not something that you are, and let them go. And that solution is ancient, it is time-tested, it is brilliant, it works for everyone, no matter what your age or gender or cultural background, educational background, doesn't matter, it works for everyone. But, you know, in today's day and age, <laughs> it's not very popular. Because it's missing one key ingredient that we all crave for in today's day and age, and that is instant gratification. Simply put, it takes time. It takes time. You need to sit at least 15 minutes a day for months and even years before you are really able to live your life from that witnessing perspective, being completely present in the moment without letting your thoughts and emotions jumping uh, to the past and bringing and sadness and nostalgia and anger or to the future that will bring you anxiety and fears and so on and so on. When you are present, when you are when you live your life from a position of a witness and not from a position of mind-made perception, everything just falls into its place. But it takes time. So, we are going to introduce another solution. So, this Buddha solution you may call a direct solution, direct path. You go straight to your true nature. And then, from that perspective, you see what you don't like. And you change it. Actually, it, it falls into its place by itself, but nevertheless. You assume position of witness, of your true nature, of your true self, and everything else falls into its place. There is another path that is giving us instant gratification <laughs> and that's why it's well more and more popular, growing more and more popular in these days. And you may call it progressive path. And it works through your perceptions and through your life. So you are using circumstances that you do not prefer, then you analyze them, and then you see what exactly is in that me mechanism of your brain that made you angry when your friend didn't pick you up at the airport, and then you change it. And these changes are well, rapid, uh, usually immediately. Sometimes it may take few days or weeks, but usually changes are really immediate and that's why this solution is popular. But let me be perfectly clear once again. 
it still requires you to sit 15 minutes a day in a meditation. Because you need that healthy detachment from Buddha's solution. You need to be able to notice, to observe, to, to say, hmm, look, I am angry. How interesting! <laughs> Why am I angry? Let's fix that. And that is just not going to happen while you are identifying with your emotion and you feel justified anger because you have all kinds of reasons. So these two approaches do not exclude one another. They complement each other. By meditating 15 minutes a day, you will greatly increase your a capability of, uh, of following the progressive path and then by solving your issues with progressive path you will greatly help your meditation practice one will reinforce the other so let's pop up the hood and see what really our personality is made of and we are going to share with a, a map or diagram that's called the personality structure and it will be much clearer once we start. So, our personality starts with senses. So, we have senses, at least five main. You know, hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, tasting. And they are our inputs to the world. All the information that we are basing our decisions and um, life on are coming to our brain through our senses. And if you never thought about that, that's really interesting to think about. That inside your skull is a pitch black. It's a complete darkness. You feel like there is some light inside because you have eyes and you have neurons that are converting that light uh, to some kind of uh, electric signal impulses that your brain decodes as a light. But actually inside your brain is a pitch black. <laughs> and all the inputs are coming through our senses. And then that senses will forward that information to your brain and your brain will first pass them through one layer that's called definitions and beliefs. Definitions are first layer of your, well, decoding your reality. And this is really important. That's why I will put it inside the black box. And we'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll return to this black box. But what, I, what we wanted to point out is that definitions and beliefs then create your emotions. So, from your senses, to the well, black box, still unknown for now, <laughs> definitions and beliefs, and then they create emotions. Okay, let me give you a few examples. Let's start with definitions. You cannot have any emotion whatsoever if you don't have a definition attached to it first. For example, how do you feel, feel when I say kikiriki? <laughs> no emotions, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Well, kikiriki is a Croatian word for peanuts. Okay, now, do you have now any emotion when I say kikiriki? Okay, that's because you have the same emotion as when I say peanuts, because you attached that definition of kikiriki to peanuts. And it doesn't matter what that emotion actually is, at this moment <laughs> at least. 
maybe you love peanuts and when, now when I say kikiriki you say mmm kikiriki do you have any? <laughs> I love peanuts or maybe you're allergic to peanuts and then when I say kikiriki you say it's a good thing you told me how to say peanuts in Croatian because maybe one day I'll be on vacation in Croatia <laughs> and I will be able to say in the restaurant but please no kikiriki inside <laughs> okay so we have from zero emotion to some emotion, whatever it is, maybe it's uh, well, delight or joy because you love peanuts, maybe it's fear because you are uh, allergic to peanuts, but that jump from zero to something was immediate, right? Just by giving a definition of some kind to a concept you never heard about. Before we gave uh, definition for kikiriki, you had no emotion whatsoever. Okay, let's take another example. How do you feel when I say hekla? Zero. <laughs> okay, no, no, it's not Croatian word. <laughs> hekla is a place. It's actually a mountain in Iceland. Now, how do you feel about hekla now? Brr, mountain, Iceland, Iceland, brr, kind of cold, right? <laughs> well, not exactly, because it's not actually a mountain, it's a volcano. It is an active volcano. How do you feel about Hekla now? Now it's not so cold, right? <laughs> now it's even dangerous. <laughs> you are not exactly sure if you want to be there. <laughs> so you see, we jumped from zero emotion, so Hekla at first, if you don't know what it is, there is no emotion whatsoever, to brrr, cold, to hot and fearful in under 10 seconds. See how that goes. If you do not have a definition for something, you can't have an emotion. Meaning that when you have an emotion, that means and it is 100% provable, <laughs> it's, uh, we're completely sure about it. If you have any kind of emotion to any kind of situation or thing, that means that you already have a definition or belief attached to it. How about this? Take a look at this picture. Okay, now we'll put a title to it. The deer is crossing the road. Now, how do you feel about that situation of deer crossing the road? Nice, warm and fuzzy ride, a beautiful animal, and you even feel protective because, oh, beautiful deer, please move out of the road because a car might hit you, and yeah, it's warm and fuzzy and so on. Does that picture remind you of something? Any memories popping up? Maybe of Bambi, <laughs> your favorite kid's book. <laughs> Maybe you think of your pet at home or some other beautiful animal that you like. Maybe squirrel, maybe cat. You know, you feel warm and fuzzy and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's put that picture back once more. But this time we'll give it a different title. And this time, title is The Road is Crossing the Forest. Now that's a completely different situation because now we see that this deer is actually in his home. And let's say that this road was built yesterday for simplicity purposes. <laughs> so yesterday that same deer was walking through that same place and it was a beautiful forest, it was his home, but not now. Now we built a road through that and we chopped trees and we destroyed some nature and now cars are passing through and with all the carbon dioxide and so on and so on. Now that emotion that comes with that picture of road crossing the forest is not that beautiful, warm and fuzzy. How do you feel now? Different, okay. But what are you thinking about right now? 
any memories, uh, what, what does that remind you of? It's, it probably reminds you of how people are terrible to nature, how we are uh, destroying our environment and maybe you're thinking about global warming or climate change or how it's only a matter of time when this deer is going to be endangered species and so on and so on. It is a completely different emotion, but what we wanted, wanted to point out is that with that emotion always comes a memory that is 100% compatible with the emotional state that you are already in. So, let's put that in green. Emotions are connected to our memories. Memories. And if you have a warm and fuzzy emotion because that beautiful animal is crossing the road, then you will have warm and fuzzy memories. And if you are thinking about how we destroyed that forest and we actually actively put that poor animal in danger because yesterday or the day before yesterday, before we built that road, it wasn't in any kind of harm, but now it is, you have completely different kind of memories. And that is also one of the things that we pointed out in the second chapter. Do you remember that uh, uh, research from Gray and La Violette that says that thoughts are filed in a memory bank according to the various shades of feeling associated with those thoughts? But now you may say that um, this is all very fine and great, but it's not very useful because you are not watching pictures of deers <laughs> crossing the forest every day and actually you don't care very much about Hekla or about Kikiriki. <laughs> so let me give you another example. Let's, for example, talk about forgiveness. Now you all know or at least you heard that when someone hurts you, you should forgive him because you are the one that's holding on to that let's say, for example, anger, and you are drinking poison and expect the other person to die. But forgiveness for many of us or for most of us doesn't exactly come easy, right? So let's make a test. Think about a person that hurt you somehow and you know that you should forgive him or her, but there is certain resistance inside yourself Somehow, it's not that easy, okay? Now, let's redefine the forgiveness. <laughs> what is forgiveness? Let me put it this way. Let's say that forgiveness is when you stop hoping for a better past. <laughs> now, aren't you doing just that? So someone hurt you, your friend, your boss, your wife, whatever. And now you won't let that go. Because you have a wrong definition of forgiveness. You think that by forgiving someone, for example, maybe that's not your case, but for example, by forgiving you will somehow invalidate your feelings or you will uh, say that he was right or she was right and not you and you don't want that because you know that you are right <laughs> well okay but that's not what forgiveness is forgiveness is letting go of a hope for a better past and when you put it that way and you know that you cannot change your past is it easier now to forgive just Think about that same situation now that made you angry or hurt and think about forgiveness as letting go of the idea of a better past. There is never going to be a better past <laughs> because that happened and you can't change it. But you, if you let go of a hope or of an idea for a better past, it may heal you, 
it may heal you because you will let go of that vibration of hurt and anger and sadness and apathy and guilt and shame and whatever you're holding. You don't need it. That's a baggage that you don't need. Just let it go. How are you going to let, you going to, let it go? By stopping your hopes <laughs> for a better past. Now, is that easier? You see how powerful it is. And the results are immediate. Two minutes ago, five minutes ago, you, when you were thinking about that person who hurt you, there was a knot inside you. I'm not going to forgive him or forgive her because he deserved it. <laughs> but suddenly now, you know, it's in the past. And are you really going to hope for a better past? Thank you. <laughs> okay. And we are going to talk a lot about definitions and beliefs uh, later, but let me give you just one more. How do you feel about a job? So, you probably have a job of some kind, you know, doing something. <laughs> what is your definition of a job? Well, for most people, well, they never thought about it, of course, but if you really squeeze them, <laughs> they will say something like, well, job is something that I need to do in order to get money. Or, if to put it a little bit more bluntly, a job is a form of slavery that I need to endure in order to pay my bills. And that definition is really depressing. I mean, <laughs> of course, that you don't want to go to work if you define it that way. Redefine it. How about this one? Job is when I get paid for doing something that I love. Or job is... Just find what resonates with you. Uh, when I get paid for doing something that I enjoy, that I'm good at, uh, that uh, somehow contributes to other people, uh, it's not about, you know, you being a slave. Or you may put it this way. You may even replace the word. And you may say, for example, well, my job is my hobby. My paid hobby. So, when my job is my hobby, I will call it a jobby. <laughs> and you are not going tomorrow to work, you are going to your jobby. <laughs> now, is it easier now? Now, see how powerful that is. And in the next section, we are going to talk exclusively about definitions. And we are going to redefine relationships, abundance, uh, what, what exactly does manifestation mean, and uh, love, and so on and so on. And each and every one of these definitions will, well, will take a positive spin on the things that you endure every day. Huh? And therefore, it will create a positive emotion. Because negative definitions create negative emotions. When forgiveness is about admitting your mistake and you know that you didn't make a mistake, he did it. Well, that's a negative definition. But if you say, I'm letting go of my hope for a better past, that is a positive one. And negative definitions create negative emotions. Positive definitions create positive emotions. And it is your choice. You redefine things as you wish, as you please. Just take note <laughs> that well, however you define it, you are going to have emotional uh, impact. And you choose how you want to feel. And then you find a definition that fits your well, personality, <laughs> that fits your wish to be well, feeling in a certain way. Okay. Now let's talk about beliefs. <laughs> this is even well weirder. <laughs> Let's say, for example, that one day you are sitting somewhere in the nature and there is some river or stream nearby and you are enjoying and it's a beautiful day 
And then suddenly, out of nowhere, three large dogs run out of that forest and start running toward you. How do you feel? <laughs> well, it depends on your beliefs. Because if you love dogs and if you have a dog at home, let's say a dog roughly this size, then you will probably feel joyful because these dogs are joyful and they are happy and oh look how beautiful they are and maybe you will try to find a stick to throw them and you are going to play you will feel joy but if you believe if you believe that these animals might be dangerous and maybe even that they are chasing you you are going to be scared. So your emotional reaction on this situation, three dogs running toward you, it is 100% a consequence of your belief what is or might happen, what is happening or what might happen. It has nothing to do with reality. You don't know what these dogs are up to. <laughs> I mean, not for sure. But you believe that these are good and loyal animals and man's best friend. If you believe that, you will feel joy. And if you believe that this is a dangerous situation, you will be afraid. It is all about your beliefs. Or how about this? Your boss called you for a meeting. So, you, one day you come to your office and then your secretary says, oh, boss wants to meet you at 10 o'clock. How are you going to feel about that situation? Entirely depends on what your belief. Because if you believe that uh, these last few months or years you've been doing one hell of a job and you are the best salesman or whatever it is that you do in your company that you see aha now my boss wants to see me because he probably wants to offer me a better position or raise or something like that if you believe that for example company is in trouble and you see that uh, well, sales results are abysmal and you work in sales, you will probably feel anxious because and nervous and a little bit afraid because this might not be a good thing. Maybe he wants to fire me. And you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, let's say that you don't know, but your emotional state and also your memories. So if you believe that he is going to fire you, you will probably remember, just in your mind, uh, chew about how you made that mistake and that mistake and how difficult it was to find this job and how am I going to find another. But if you feel that that is a good news, you're probably going to have memories about uh, this achievement that you made and that and this sales result and how company is booming and so on and so on. It is all about your beliefs. And of course, it's completely the same thing when your wife tells you, you know, tonight we need to talk. <laughs> that's, you know, if you believe that your relationship is in trouble, that's really bad news. Of course, if you still want that relationship. But if you believe that uh, it is a time to plan for your vacation, then you will say, yeah, yeah, we need to talk. I, I also have a few ideas. And you have no idea what she wants to talk about. But your emotion is created by your belief. No belief. <laughs> your belief shapes your emotion entirely in this case. And, you know, some, once one, one man told me, one guy, you know, that's all fine about definitions and beliefs, but I don't believe in anything. I'm an atheist. <laughs> well, no, you're a cynic, but nevertheless, 
you always believe 100% in something. For example, you 100% believe that the gravity will work in this room during this lecture. Otherwise, you would be wearing seatbelt or at least a helmet <laughs> because you might float <laughs> and you would be afraid to walk on the road because what if gravity stops working and I just float away? <laughs> also, when you go to bed any evening, any night, you have 100% belief that you are going to wake up. Otherwise, you would be terrified <laughs> to go to sleep. But you go to sleep peacefully and calmly, and that's actually a very important prerequisite for you getting to some sleep. <laughs> you won't be able to sleep, uh, to get to sleep at all, if you are <laughs> afraid that maybe you are not going to wake up. Or maybe, you know, you, you are sitting here without any worries because you believe that someone competent calculated the stability of this building. And you believe that these materials that someone used to build this room are top quality or at least adequate quality. Otherwise, you would be staring at the ceiling if it is going to fall on you. And there is no such thing as 50-50% belief. You always believe one 100%. And you may say, you know, I doubt this is accurate, and that's fine, but doubting that this is accurate doesn't make it 50-50. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. When you doubt about something, let's say this map, at least so far, you are actually 100% certain that it is not accurate. There is no uh, you know, half a belief. You always believe totally, 100% in whatever that you are believing. So, for example, let's say that someone asks me now, are we going to repeat this lecture tomorrow? And maybe I'll say, oh, I doubt it. Now, is that yes, no, or maybe? It's not maybe, it is no. It is 100% no. Whatever you believe, you believe 100% in it. So you don't need to build a trust, <laughs> build the beliefs. <laughs> you just need to find out what you are believing and how it is shaping your reality. And if you find the belief that is not uh, aligned with your true self, with your true nature, or at least with your desires and wishes. If you find a belief that shaping your reality, your emotional state in a way that you do not prefer, you just change it. We'll show you later how to do that. But please make note, this is a personality construct. And we are not finished yet. <laughs> this is a person. So these definitions and beliefs are personal. Unfortunately, there is no tool that or device that you can plug yourself into and press big red button and that lists you all the negative beliefs or negative definitions that you have. That would be great, but it would also beat the point because you want your experience of life to be, well, personal, to be unique. And you are unique. Your true nature is absolutely unique. It's not about changing the beliefs that are, well, universally harmful. It is about changing your beliefs in a way that are more aligned with your true nature. So, if you ask me, what do I exactly believe that's making me perceive my life in a miserable way? The answer is, I don't know. And neither do you. Now, isn't that interesting? We have this black box of definitions and beliefs. 
And some of these definitions and beliefs uh, you picked up uh, from the society, some of them from your friends, from your schooling, from your education, from your relationships, from your experiences, and so on and so on. But never mind. You have a black box that's completely shaping your reality, your emotional state, your memories, and as we will see, also thoughts and so on. And you have no idea what's inside. However, you have a debugging tool, as programmers would say. You have a tool for finding what is not in alignment with yourself, and these are your emotions. So, something happens, you are going to pick that up with your senses. It will be automatically filtered through your system of definitions and beliefs. And if you do not like the emotion that you are getting, well, find out what is the belief that coloring your experience in a way that you do not prefer and just fix it. But for now it is very important to just accept and recognize the idea that you have no idea what you believe in and what is shaping your well, perception of reality. And it is exactly like Bertrand Russell told us. I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. You are filtering your perception of reality through the black box. That's extremely powerful and you have no idea what's inside. But we'll get back to that. We'll have a huge part of this course is about detecting and correcting definitions and beliefs that are not aligned with your true nature or your true self, or at least with your preference. Okay, But let us finish the map. Your emotions, or your emotional state, or your vibratory state, is what creating your thoughts. So, we already discussed in the uh, well, second chapter that your thoughts and your image uh, emotions and your memories are always 100% consistent with the vibratory state that you are already in. But this is, uh, this is kind of surprising, because this says that your thoughts are being shaped by your emotional state. And this is also a little bit of a shocker, because if you ever um, well, read anything about positive psychology, for example, they insist on the idea that your thoughts are shaping your emotions. And that's easy to prove. Because if I think now of something that is really joyful and happy for me, for, or some situation that I lived through, some good memory, or something that makes me happy and joyful, I will immediately feel, well, happy emotion. If I think about something that makes me anxious or angry, I will have the emotions of anger and fear. So, in a way, thoughts are creating emotions, but through your definitions and beliefs. So, your thoughts are going this way. And they are kind of another input into your well, layer of of definitions and beliefs. And this arrow, <laughs> this is something that we called imagination. Imagination. Imagination is a really, really powerful tool because you can think about a situation and then know exactly how you would feel if that ever happens, without having to go through that <laughs> situation itself. So, imagination is a really, really powerful tool. But it has also a flip side, because, you know, there are no one-sided coins in this universe. <laughs> so, 
uh, imagination also has a flip side, you may call it the dark side, and that's called worrying. When you worry about anything, so you are using your imagination to conjure uh, situations and um, whatever things that you do not prefer. You are creating vibratory state or emotional state that you do not prefer. And suddenly you will have memories of all the uh, past experiences and situations that, um, that are somehow connected with that vibratory state. So, so if you are worrying about something, you will remember about uh, other things that are attached to the same vibratory state when you were in a state of fear and worry. And that is just not healthy. And that is another reason why you must, well, why we should recommend <laughs> for you to meditate at least 15 minutes a day. Because once you get pulled into this vicious circle of worrying, using your, uh, abusing your imagination, uh, then it is, a, well, it is a vicious circle. It, it, it just reinforces itself. So, let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, one day you go to the doctor and he says that you have some kind of disease. And it's not exactly lethal, but it's not exactly pleasant. Um, you are going to need two or three years of some kind of therapy. And there are maybe some side effects and maybe you'll never be as good as new and so on and so on. And you immediately begin to worry. And when you start to worry, you will have trouble sleeping, you will have trouble eating, that will destroy your appetite. And that's not healthy. That's not helping you in this scenario of you having some kind of sickness or disease. Actually, it's making you worse. And now you, uh, you will notice that, of course, or someone will tell you after seven days, oh, come on, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, you're not going to get better by doing that. And now you will worry that you worry. <laughs> now, and now you know that, of course, that that's not good for you and you will begin to worry that you worry. And that's another vicious circle. And that is another well, point <laughs> where uh, Buddhist tradition or Zen or whatever is somehow, sometimes even cruel when they are trying to jolt you into that understanding. So there is one story, and that is a real life story, so it's not made up from tradition 2000 years ago. It is something that actually happened to one guy. He, he was, uh, he is, he's still alive. He is a European, and he fell in love with uh, Buddhism, with Theravada tradition, somewhere in the late 60s. And he went to Thailand, I believe, in some temple, some ashram, and, but after a few months uh, he picked up uh, some kind of disease that locals are mostly immune to. But he was European, he was not immune to, and so he uh, went to the hospital and they told him there is a 50-50 chance that you'll live through it. And now he's in a hospital lying in his bed and one day his master, his teacher, comes to visit him. And he was delighted. <laughs> no, that's such an honor. <laughs> and he immediately <laughs> fixes up his hair a little bit <laughs> and sits on the bed. And the master comes to him. Well, I said, well, you know, maybe you live, maybe you won't. And leaves. <laughs> now the question is, was that helpful? It was. Because he reminded him that by worrying about uh, am I going to live, what if I don't, um, and where am I going to be buried, and who is going to carry me <laughs> home, and so on and so on, that's not helpful. That's really not what he should do. He should let go of that worrying, and by letting go of that thoughts that are filtered through the belief that 
uh, dying is terrible, for example. <laughs> it's one of the beliefs that are connected with that situation. Or maybe I will never be the same again. He created bad emotion and more bad thoughts and then more bad memories. But his master told him, you know, maybe you die, maybe you won't. You can't do anything about that. You can help your healing by not worrying about what's going to happen. But still, used properly, imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is the language of the soul. And that's incredibly insightful that your imagination is the language of your soul. Just a little bit later, we are going to define imagination as a conduit to your higher self. And it's pretty much the same thing, just using different words. But let us not rush into things. <laughs> let us first finish our personality construct or personality structure or map of personality, however you wish to call it. It is your thoughts that are 100% responsible for shaping your Actions. Your actions are coming well, out of your thoughts. And then further down the line, your actions will shape your reality. So, whatever it is that you are doing or you've ever done, <laughs> it was preceded by some kind of thought. And that's not about to change. <laughs> so, for example, tomorrow morning your alarm clock will wake you up. And then you will see that it is 7 a.m. And immediately a thought will come. I need to get up. I need to get to work. And then you will get up. You will get up according to your thought. I need to get up. And then another thought will come. I need to fix myself a breakfast or I need to make some coffee. And then I need to put some clothes on. And then car keys, where are my car keys? <laughs> so whatever it is that you are doing, or you will be doing, or you ever done, it was and is and it will be preceded by some kind of thought. And your actions, inspired by your thought, is what is going to create and shape your reality. And this is really worth emphasizing, because it is such a common fallacy. A lot of people are claiming that in order to have a beautiful reality, reality of your dreams, all you need to do is think happy thoughts and feel great, feel beautiful, and that will somehow put you in a vibration that will allow the universe to somehow magically transport you to the reality of your dreams. Well, yes and no. <laughs> Certainly, visualizations and imagination and uh, fantasizing and daydreaming are great as a tool to put you in a proper vibratory state and you will know that you are in a better vibratory state because you will feel better. And that will give you access to the thoughts that are consistent with the higher levels of consciousness, to inspiring thoughts. But then you need to put some actionable energy behind your, those thoughts. You need to convert those inspiring thoughts into an inspired action. And that is going to well, put you one step closer to the reality of your dreams. But you need to ground that energy through action. Because as much as the imagination is the language of your soul, actions are language of a physical reality. Because the world is changed by your example not by your opinion. If you don't put some actionable energy behind your thoughts, your thoughts will just remain a fantasy, however imaginative or creative or inspiring they are. You need to ground them. You need to 
convert them through your actions into reality of your dreams. And sometimes it's really funny to watch how these ideas that your actions create your reality get twisted along the way. So, for example, there is a word in Sanskrit language. Sanskrit is a language of the ancient Indian sages and mystics, and it is karma. So, you probably heard of the word. Karma is usually understood, misunderstood, <laughs> and mistranslated in our language as either destiny, something that you cannot change, it is just the way it is, it is your bad karma that things happen in a way that you do not prefer, or, that's even weirder, it is some weird universal law of uh, punishment and words. So, if you want to live inside a beautiful reality, all you need to do is create a, a more positive points and uh, less negative points. <laughs> well, that's kind of true, but literally, word karma in Sanskrit means action. What are they trying to tell us? That it is your actions that will create your reality, or actually that your life is of your own making. Your life is of your own making, but your life is not of your own thinking or feeling. It is of your own making. It is essential in order to have a high quality inspired action, to have high quality inspired thoughts. And they are coming from your well, emotional state, or emotional state is reflective of your vibratory state, so you need to be in a good vibration in order to have uh, higher quality thoughts, but then you need to ground them into appropriate action in order to have a reality that you prefer, and that your senses are going to pick up. And the circle well, continues. Now you may ask, how is this going to help us? It will help us immensely, because now we know where to look for. Because in the second chapter, we analyzed in a lot of details the idea that your emotions and thoughts and memories and reactions and perceptions, and it is just a fancy word for all of that, are a consequence of your vibratory state. And your vibratory state depends on one thing and one thing only, and it is content of this black box of your definitions and beliefs. You don't have to force yourself to feel better, or to force yourself to have happy thoughts, or to force yourself to go into uh, beautiful memories that you have. That may help, but you don't need any of that. All you need to do <laughs> is examine the content of this, well, your definitions and beliefs. Because otherwise, what's going to happen? You are going to, uh, well, notice that you don't prefer your reality and that when you think about, for example, your job, it is creating a lot of anxiety and anger in, in you. And you will sit into meditation and do a beautiful visualization. You will visualize perfect scenario, or you will visualize you being happy on a beach or whatever, and that will put you in a proper vibration. But for how long? Once you open your eyes, <laughs> you will notice that nothing a lot changed <laughs> significantly. <laughs> So, you're just going to get all those anger and anxiety back. And not only that, you will probably feel guilty, because everyone else can visualize their perfect scenario, it's just not working for you, so you need, there's something wrong with you, you will feel worthless and shame and guilt, and that's even worse than you began. You don't need to do that. It may work for some people, but if, if it's not working for you, we are suggesting easier solution. And the solution is to understand, for now, that all your vibratory state and therefore emotions and thoughts and memories and actions 
are consequence of one thing and one thing only, and it is contents of this box. Your vibratory state is tuned by one button. Or maybe slider. <laughs> Just like on those old radio uh, you know, receivers, there was one button for frequency, and by changing that frequency, you change the station that you are listening, and you hear a different kind of music. You know, it is just one thing to take care and to look for, and it is your definitions and beliefs. Once you align your definitions and beliefs with your true self or true nature or with your preference, everything else will fall into its place automatically, by itself. You will automatically feel better. And actually, that's how you will know that the change that you made inside your definition and belief systems is the one that you prefer, because you will feel better. And once you feel better, you will have access to thoughts that are uh, representative or consistent with the higher levels of consciousness, creative thoughts, inspiring thoughts that will allow you to put some actionable energy behind them, and ground those ideas through an inspired actions, and that will really shape your reality. All you need to do, all you need to take care of is the content of this black box. Finding out definitions and beliefs that are out of alignment with your true nature, with your true self, or with your preference, finding them, changing them, and the rest will just go on or flow automatically. But first, you need to find out what exactly are the definitions and beliefs that are out of alignment with your true nature or with your true self. And you may ask, how are you going to find them? Well, it's not as difficult as it seems.